Congresswoman Sherry Bustos from the state of Illinois and a graduate from the University of Maryland. Thank you to my fellow TERP, uh, Congressman Rupersberger, I appreciate that. Uh, General Hokanson, uh, thanks for your service and your leadership. I'm gonna direct my questions to you and thank you to the other panelists also for your, for your service. We, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, General Hokanson, uh, since the start of the, the Russian invasion, I'm, I'm gonna focus a little bit, um, uh, be parochial here, but the Illinois National Guard has provided hundreds of thousands of dollars and literally tons of critical medical supplies, ambulance support, humanitarian goods uh, for the people of Ukraine. And the Illinois Guard has also continued to maintain a three decade old state partnership program and security cooperation with Poland, which really has, we've seen that it's proven to be critical to, to global security today. So uh, General, I, I wanted to get your perspective on the capacity challenges the National Guard may be facing with everything that they're being asked to do, responding to, to COVID-19, our domestic disaster responses, the, the crisis in Ukraine, just you know, to name a few, but how, how is the National Guard holding up? Are there any missions that have had to be put on hold to handle these high priority cases? If you can kind of just give us a lay of the land. Yes, ma'am, and thank you. And that's a, a very, very important question. When we look at our guardsmen and their ability, and, and frankly, all reservists, to balance their civilian career, their military career, and their family. And we have asked a lot of them, not only over the past 20 years, but especially over the last two years. And obviously, the crisis in Ukraine is also even bringing that more to light. And fortunately, what I'm finding is everywhere I go, everybody said, look, we love what we're doing. And we have historically high retention rates. And so our guardsmen, you know, they're, they're voting by staying in, that they like their ability to not only help out in their communities, but help out internationally and to deploy. And when you look at all that we've asked our guardsmen to do over the last two years, particularly related to COVID, civil disturbances and deployments, there's not a single mission that we missed. And when a certain case state needed additional capacity, other states volunteered or through the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, they came to their help um, for anything that they needed. And so when I look at that, I, I think we're in a really good spot. Now there are certain areas where we really have to rely on our first level leaders to work with their soldiers and airmen and their families to find that right balance for those that may be in a critical area. But I think we've been able to balance that really well. And a lot of that goes back to the, to the funding that we receive and really the expectation of our guardsmen when they come in today, they expect to deploy. They expect to help out in their communities. And we've been very fortunate that our employers support that as well. So we do keep a close pulse on it, ma'am, and thank you for asking. But, you know, we're, we're still in a really good place right now. Thank you, General. And, I, and obviously, um, as you talked about in your opening statements with your with your mantra, always ready, always there, this is all playing out. Um, you know how important, I'm gonna uh, switch gears a little bit, but you know how important the 182nd Airlift Wing in Peoria, Illinois is to, uh, to your overall operation, and obviously to, to us here in Illinois, to we here in Illinois. But um, you know, they're, they, they have consistently maintained the highest mission capability rate in the Air National Guard, and the, the C-130 community has, has been recognized for winning their 10th Outstanding Unit Award. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, you know, thanks to you, to General Brown, to General Scobie, we, we've made significant progress to keep our C-130 units going. And as they continue to face the challenges and the need for continued investments and in modernization, um, if you could weigh in first, and if we have time, General Scobie can also maybe weigh in on this, but, but um, how does the Guard plan to address this in the coming years, the, the challenges and the need for continued investment and in modernization? Yes, ma'am. And when you look at our C-130 fleet, as we have seen every year, not only internationally, but domestically, the importance of that capability to provide airlift um, into almost any environment is something that we absolutely have to retain. And so when we look at the C-130Js, obviously, that's where we would like to get to eventually. But between now and then, everything we can do to upgrade our H models with the newer engines, the intercontrol fuel system, the, uh, the mission package and as well as the propellers, things like that, we look to extend the life of the current airframes out to 2040, which gives us more time to replace those um, age models with J models. But also it's really trying to find that balance as we modernize our fighter fleet as well, 
with only a set number of resources, trying to make put our investments where they're the most critical. But in this case, we want to retain that capability um, any way that we can and make sure that it's modernized and relevant. Uh, General Scobia, we can maybe follow up offline because my time's expired and I want to be respectful of my colleagues. Um, with that, I, I yield back, uh, Mr. Rupert. Thank you so much.